Tanaka certainly is now the Yankees' ace of the future, provided he stays healthy. Um, I think that there were some doubts about Sabathia's health, obviously, and about his uh, his effectiveness going forward. So, I mean, there was, there was time for a change here, and you knew it was going to be either Sabathia or Tanaka, even if, you know, some people can make the case that Michael Pineda has pitched better than both of them this spring, but it certainly wasn't going to be him. It was going to be either the former ace or the future ace, and uh, the future is what won out here. Who is that, Wally Matthews? That would be Wallace Matthews. Yankees open up their season. Big set against the Toronto Blue Jays on Monday. Just a reminder, we are the South Florida home of New York Yankee baseball. That's right. They're on the uh, WFAN, my uh, stomping grounds up in New York, and we've got them down here. Every pitch, every game, John Sterling, Susan Waldman. The season actually starts, though, Sunday night at Wrigley Field where the team that has now won the NL Central the last two years in a row, the St. Louis Cardinals, will take on a team that a lot of people think can win it, although I think they're nuts, the Chicago Cubs. And uh, and then everybody else gets going on Monday. The Mets uh, in Washington for the Nationals, Bartolo Colon on the mound, and your Marlins will host Atlanta here coming up on Monday. And what better way? with baseball season just a couple of days away, to usher baseball season in than with Tim McCarver. A glorious career, 21 years between 1959 and uh, 1976. Most of those years spent between the St. Louis Cardinals and the Philadelphia Phillies, catching guys like Bob Gibson and Steve Carlton, involved in one of the most famous trades in Major League Baseball history with Kurt Flood, who, of course, started all of free agency, a couple of very memorable World Series appearances, winning with the cards in 64 and 67. And then, of course, this illustrious, this glorious broadcasting career, uh, mostly with my New York Mets. Great years with Timmy with the Mets, and uh, now he's back in St. Louis. I believe he's done more World Series games on television than anybody alive or dead. He is really Mr. Baseball, and he's a great guy. And I'm honored to have him again with baseball season right around the corner. My friend Tim McCarver. Timmy, it's Sid. Good morning, pal. How are you? I'm doing great, Sid. I appreciate that marvelous prelude. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You know, it's it's got to be pretty cool, though. I know you've heard a lot. You've heard this a million times. and But it's still got to be pretty cool to hear all of that and go, Jesus Christ, I did all that? <laughs> And I'm still only 73, so I've got some good years left in me. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that that's the case. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm really looking forward. I go to Chicago on Sunday, and, of course, ESPN has the game on Sunday night, and depending on whether there's a rain out or a snow out or a cold <laughs> out, uh, the, as far as I'm concerned, the Cardinals open their season on Tuesday night and then again on Wednesday afternoon, and... Uh, it's going to be an interesting season with the Cardinals opening on Sunday night with five left-handed batters in the lineup against John Lester. That should be a, a good spot there for Lester. But before I get back to the Cardinals this year, I, I like to do this. I've got Smoltz, John Smoltz, coming up at 9. Of course, he's going into the Hall of Fame this summer. And I actually remember John Smoltz's first start. I can't. Timmy, I hate to say this. I was born in 67. I can't say the same about you. So I, I believe, if I'm correct, 1963 was really your first full season. As, a full year, yes. Yes. So going back to your very first opening day, 1963, we're talking 50 years. Do you remember that pr- pretty vividly, that first opening day? I remember the f- I remember opening day of 1963, and I remember the last game in 1963. And it was a a season in which Pete Rose was the Rookie of the Year and Stan Musial retired. So I I remember, and I'm so proud that I had a chance to to play with number six for a full year. I'd always, uh, growing up in Memphis, of course, always uh, held this guy in such high esteem and... and, uh, And, of course, he passed away a couple of years ago. But, boy, you talk about a a gentleman in every respect. And could he he ever hit? 
I mean, uh, the, the low fastball, I, the, probably never a hitter in the history of the game. And it's hard to say never because I, I didn't see guys prior to the, to the mid-1950s, but, um, but you couldn't be a better low ball hitter than Stan Musial was. Mm. Seven batting crowns. I mean, he was, he was a gentleman in every way. I think back to some of the guys. Now I think about it. Now, when you first got to St. Louis, uh, first came up, you didn't catch. Wasn't Joe Torre catching then? What was the deal there? No, when I first came up to St. Louis, actually, Hal Smith oh, that's was right. the catcher. That's and he right. had a heart attack in 1961. So, therefore, I was up parts of 1959, 60, and 61, and then spent a full year in the minors in 62, and then uh, I became the regular catcher in 63, and Joe Torrey didn't come over until 1969 in a trade. Right. Uh, straight up for Orlando Cepeda. That's and right. That's what a right. player Joe Torre right. was. Right. Too. So, but when you think back then to the guys you played with in St. Louis, you mentioned Stan the Man Musial. Um, obviously, Roger Maris was there in St. Louis with you. You caught Gibson, who won two World Series MVPs in 64 and 67. So if you just put together a list of guys that you played with those years in St. Louis, Timmy, it's got to be as impressive as anybody's list in the history of the game. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Lou Brock, the trade for Lou Brock on June 14th, 1964, for Ernie Brolio. Um, uh, you mentioned Roger Maris, and uh, we were shocked at how well Roger Maris played the other part of the game, the other part of the game other than his power and his home runs, of course, the 61 and 61. Um, and uh, and Orlando Cepeda, the, the first unanimous uh, MVP in in the National League in 1967. And you mentioned Gibson and uh, Kurt Flood was a terrific player. That that was a uh, I mean by the time I was 26 years old, I was in three World Series. Wow. Wow, and of I mean, course, that's, hard to that's, believe. that's I not know, pretty good. I, I have to shake myself, uh, uh, and you think you're going to be in more, but um, I played in three, and uh, you mentioned it. Uh, I've worked uh, 24 World Series, and that's why I stepped away a couple of years ago. It was just uh, the the stress was uh, was too much. Sure. I loved it. Uh, but now I'm doing 40 Cardinal games a year, and that's enough. That's enough, yeah. Now, listen, you, you, sorry, I forgot you played in three because you did lose to Detroit. That Mickey Lolich, uh, who to this day is one of the worst trades in Met history, a young rusty stop from Mickey Lolich. And, and not only that, a losing team with probably, I mean, you could make a case that it was the best World Series game ever pitched when Gibson struck out 17 uh, in the first game in 1968. Uh, uh, and that's never never been done prior to that or since that right. uh, that time. And Bob, as a matter of fact, has a new book coming out uh, about Game One. It's good too. It's written along with Lonnie Wheeler, and it's a it's a very very good uh, book about uh, Game One when Gibson struck out seventeen. Funny, you look back at those World Series, uh, that game went against the Tigers, but you won seven every time. You, you beat the Yankees and Yogi Berra in seven right. in 64. You beat uh, Dick Williams and the Red Sox in seven in 67, and then you lost in seven to Detroit. So all you did was play that pressure-cooked game seven. Uh, that's, that's exactly right. And in and, and all of those games, Gibson worked. <laughs> uh, more than coincidence, he was, he was some performer. What an athlete. I, yeah, that's why I hate to ask you. Somebody uh, had texted me or tweeted me or asked me earlier, Tim, hey, when you get McCarver on, ask him who, who was the best pitcher he ever worked with. And, of course, he worked with another Hall of Famer in uh, St. Louis, St. Billy, and Steve Carlton, who was a magnificent pitcher, one of the great lefties of all time. But I kind of answered it for you. I said, I'm going to imagine McCarver, without any hesitation, is going to say Gibson. Without any hesitation. As a matter of fact, Steve Carlton will say that. Yeah. He learned uh, an awful lot from Gibson. In fact, after the 1968 season, we lost in seven, of course. We were up three games to one against Detroit, and they came back and won the last three. And after that season, we went to Japan to play the Japanese All-Stars, uh, 18 games in 33 days, a grueling trip, particularly after losing to Detroit uh, in seven. But that's when Steve Carlton learned his devastating slider. He learned it from Gibson on that flight 
from Saint uh, from Los Angeles to Japan in 1968. Wow, did not know that. Well, and, yeah. then, and then of yeah. course, uh, after you got traded, like you said, the Kurt Flood trade, and uh, Tory got to St. Louis in '69. You went to Philadelphia, uh, kind of right after that. Those last those last five or six years, Timmy. After all that great success, three World Series in five years with the, the Cardinals in St. Louis. What were those last five or six years like for you? Your playing days. Well, I, I primarily caught Carlton from uh, 1975 through 1979, so for about four and a half years, and those were very, very good Philly teams, uh, winning the divisions in 1976, seven and eight, and then the the uh, the signing of Pete Rose after the '78 season, and that's what really put uh, the Phillies over the hump, and they won their first. Uh, World Series uh, in 1980. That was my first year in the booth, and I came back in September of that year just to get the three decades in. And uh, what a what an eventful year that was in Philadelphia to win their first World Series after being in uh, in operation for, <laughs> for yeah. over a hundred years, yeah. and you finally win one. Yeah, though that was a fun team. You had Rose, uh, it you was. Had the Bake McBride, and Maddox, and Luzinski, and. Uh, yes. Yeah, no, that was a fun team. So you played on some uh, some pretty good teams along the way, and baseball was going pretty well. So now when you hear, Tim, here we are years and years later, and uh, there seems to be a lot of complaints, right? Uh, the game is slowed down. Maybe we need a pitch clock. We're not going to do that, but we're certainly going to make sure that the pitchers are throwing quicker and the batters are back in the box quicker. Uh, people don't like the defensive shifts that erases runs. You know, the whole steroid controversies in the 90s and 2000s. Seems like with Rob Manford coming in this year to replace Bud Selig, that for as well as baseball is doing in terms of financial uh, aspects, including international Nationally, there's a lot of bitching and complaining about the game of baseball, no? Yeah, I mean, it, it, part of it, Sid, is uh, this impatience. I mean, baseball has always been, as much as anything, the way I see it, uh, as a patient game. Um, it, it requires time. And it seems to me that uh, the modern-day fan wants an immediate uh, decision <clears throat> or an immediate reaction to what's going on in the field. And that's, uh, that's against the nature of baseball. I think there's too much complaining about the length of the game. I think some cosmetic changes are fine. Uh, if you don't lose the point, and the point of baseball, it's a different, it's a pastoral game. It's different from... Uh, uh, from other sports, and uh, I think people have have to give that a chance to play out. So while I understand, you know, for the for the young people coming in as as new fans of the game, uh, perhaps a, a, a bit uh, more of a you know of a fast paced game, but, uh, but but you can't change the nature of the game. I mean, and after all, what's the difference if a game? Averages three three hours or three hours and five minutes or three hours and ten minutes. I, I don't understand that. Uh, I, I I don't get it. Yeah. Other than other than writers complaining about that because they're on deadline. I understand the business uh, of that, but I don't think that's any reason to get all uh, up in arms about about changing the no. character of the yeah. game. I you agree. can change the pace a little bit. You can tweak it, uh, but but let's not lose the 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 focus of what the game's all about. Still my favorite sport, and uh, when I tell young people that, they tell me I'm old, <laughs> which is <laughs> I, fine. I understand that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although I think you'd admit here, Tim, that the um, the mm. lack of African American baseball players, the uh, seemingly the lost interest in some of the urban communities. Those kids uh, see the big ticket out as basketball or the NFL. I think you'd have to admit there that has become a bit of an issue for Major League Baseball. No, there's no question about it. I mean, if you, if you go into the inner city, uh, you, you don't find too many baseball fields, and yet you'll you'll find thousands of hoops, right? Uh, thousands of, uh, of baskets uh, that are just thrown up on uh, in any building, any garage. 
in the areas and a lack of Little League baseball fields. And I hope uh, that we all can do something about that. Let's get to the Cardinals this year again. They open up Sunday night. It's the only game, ESPN Baseball Docket, before the rest of the league opens up on Monday. The Cardinals have won uh, the division two years in a row. They've been to the NLCS four years in a row. I know the Giants actually passed the Cardinals last year in terms of postseason wins behind the Yankees. But with 11 World Series wins, the Cardinals are still second all time. And there's a lot of expectations here for the Cubs, but still most of the experts feel with the upstart Cubs and Pirates improving that they'd be crazy to bet against St. Louis. Your team still seems to be, Timmy, the favorite inside the NL Central. I don't know about that. Really? Uh, I, if you examine everything, I think the team that has a chance, if uh, there is a National League Central team that's going to run away with things, and you have five very good teams, very competitive division, I think Pittsburgh, uh, they have the best outfield in the National League, uh, headed by Andrew McCutcheon, of course. And, uh, and it's going to be interesting with the Cubs. I'm, I don't know that people are crazy to say that the Cubs are going to do very, very well this year. You're going to see an improvement without a doubt. The Cardinals, <clears throat> right now, breaking camp, with five left-handed batters yep. in their lineup as regular players, that uh, with the one exception, Matt Adams could be platooned uh, at first base. Uh, with Mark Reynolds, uh, the right-hander with great power and strikes out a lot. Um, but this is the first time since five regular left-handed players have started for the Cardinals since 1900. Wow. Jesus. That's really? a good one, isn't it? Yeah, that's a great one. <laughs> I just found that out wow. yesterday. Wow. Now, regular players. Now, you, you don't know whether these guys are going to be regulars or not, no. but there's every hope to, uh, to think that they are. You have Matt Carpenter at third base, Colton Wong, Jason Hayward in right field, yeah. uh, John Jay in center, and Matt Adams. Matt Adams will probably be platooned, as I said. Yeah. But, uh, you know, five guys who are your regular players, which obviously makes them vulnerable to left-handed pitchers. And yet, with that said, they've beaten the best left-handed pitcher in baseball the last two postseasons, and that's Clayton Kershaw. Oh, he has nightmares so, about I mean, your go team. figure the game out. You yeah, just can't yeah, do you it. Can't. No, he has nightmares about your team. I know that uh, the, the offseason started in a very tragic fashion for, <laughs> for the Cardinals and with Oscar Tavares and his girlfriend both being killed in a car oh. crash, one of the uh, better blue-chip prospects in all of Major League Baseball. I know the Cardinals went out and grabbed Hayward right after that, but uh, that was a, a pretty brutal way to start the offseason. No, it was it was terrible when uh, there were – there were some guys, <clears throat> pardon me, said there were some guys who were affected uh, by that too, uh, mainly Carlos Martinez, who was announced as the fifth starter for the Cardinals just the other day, even though it would be in the bullpen on Sunday night. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think you'd agree here. Two more will let you run, Tim. That, you know, you talked about the lefties in the lineup. That's going to be something they're going to have to get by those lefties inside the National League. And, you know, obviously Carlos Martinez has to come through. Lockie's got to be good again. Lance Lynn's got to be good. We know Wainwright's going to be great. But would you agree if there was one guy on this team that if he has a big year could really mean the difference? How about Michael Walker? Michael Walker is a huge chip for the Cardinals. There's no doubt about it. Without him, uh, I, I don't even think the Cardinals would be expected uh, to finish one, two, or three. That's how important Michael Walker is to the Cardinals. Hurt his shoulder last year, but uh, he appears to be healthy this year, and he could be a dominant force for St. Louis. Uh, five right-handed pitchers in their rotation, um, and uh, if, if the Cardinals uh, go on and win this thing again this year, uh, then uh, it's going to be their starting pitchers yeah. that will be pointed to. Uh, they, they are that good. The bullpen's not as strong going in as it was in the past couple of years uh, because Martinez has to become a starter, uh, but it'll be very, very good. And, and not only Michael Walker, but Trevor Rosenthal as a closer is very, very important. Yeah. 
Well, they have, they have some key guys that, you know, need to have good years if, if they expect to contend. So last one, you know, you did TV also, Tim, for the, both the Mets and the Yankees. Obviously, you spent a lot more time with the Metropolitans, but did right. the Mets and the Yankees and uh, always be loved and revered by the New York baseball fans. So even though you're Mr. St. Louis and you're doing 40 games for the Cards this year, that's where you live, that's who you are, do you still find yourself uh, rooting big time, especially the Mets? I pay attention. <laughs> it's, uh, and it's fine to pay attention to that organization in particular. And, you know, a piece of me, I was there in, uh, for 16 years doing Met games with Ralph Kiner. Uh, uh, one of the great periods of my life. I was so happy in that, in that city. And, um, and uh, to see those teams of the late 80s that dominated New York at the time. I mean, the Yankees were, were not even the second team during that period. Uh, they were, I mean, it was the New York Mets, New York Mets, New York Mets, particularly <laughs> after their world championship in 1986. And the and Giants think, in 86, the Mets won the World Series, Timmy, and the Giants won the Super Bowl that year. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's, that's pretty, pretty <laughs> powerful. I, I, I've been to several World Series parades as a player and an announcer, and I never saw anything like the four million people that, mm. Uh, mm. Uh, that, uh, that lined the, the Canyon of Heroes mm. uh, for the New York Mets in 1986. Yeah. It, was, it was really something to see. It was, especially you look, look back at that team and those maniacs. And uh, Gooden writes very honestly about it. Of course, he was not there that day at that parade. You were. He wasn't. And uh, right. n- neither right. was Strawberry. You don't miss the World Series parade. <laughs> both of those guys you were. Do that, no, you did. don't. But they did it. Dwight and Darrell both did it. Anyway, it is a, uh, it's an honor to have you on. I, I really, I, I, Tim, I got to tell you, when Zemac comes to me and goes, listen, McCarver's tomorrow, I go, Jesus, I get, I get so excited. So I, I appreciate well, you coming you on. Should. Thank you very much. And uh, John Smoltz in an hour, that's a pretty good lineup. Nice going. Thank you. You enjoy uh, the, the series against the Cubs. We'll talk again real soon, Timmy. Thank you. Oh, okay, Sid. Thank you. Be you. Well, take care. The great Tim McCarver. And what a way to start, like he said, the baseball season. Tim McCarver at 8 and uh, coming up in about 39 minutes on his way to the Hall of Fame this summer as a great Atlanta Brave, John Smoltz. 888-640-9385. We'll take a short break. We're back on the Sid Rosenberg Show on 640 Sports and WRMF. <laughs> Right after this. Get on the show. Call now. 888 640 9385. It's Sid Rosenberg on 640 Sports. There is video of the final moments of the German Wings 95 25 flight from inside of the plane. We do not have the video. The video is not public, but two publications jointly, uh, Paris Match and Build, have uh, described, they, they've seen the video, they're describing what's in the video, and this is what is just into CNN. They published descriptions in multiple languages uh, that show, and this is, a, this is a, a recording found by a source close to the investigation. This is the description of what happened inside of the plane in the final, final moments of German Wings 95-25. It says, quote, uh, according to Paris Match, the scene was so chaotic that it was hard to identify people, but the sounds of the screaming passengers made it perfectly clear that they were aware of what was about to happen to them. One can hear cries of, my God, in several languages. Metallic banging can also be heard more than three times, perhaps the pilot trying to open the cockpit door with a heavy object. Towards the end, after a heavy shake stronger than the others, the screaming intensifies, then nothing. I want to bring in Fred Pleitgen, who is in Cologne, Germany, uh, where we've heard from uh, officials there throughout the course of this investigation. First off, Fred, important to note, this is, this is a joint publi- jointly published uh, information by Build, which is the publication that uh, put out that cockpit voice recorder transcript as well. Very unusual for this information to come out. And also just, I mean, it's heart-wrenching, the, the idea of this moment of terror. Yeah, absolutely, Brianna. It's a joint publication between the Bilt and Paris Match, and they say uh, that this video was uh, taken from uh, a SIM card that was found at the crash site that seemed to have survived the crash, and therefore uh, they say that the video comes from 
uh, the circles of the investigators. They don't uh, specify where exactly they got this video from, but they do say that while it is very shaky, why it's hard to make out uh, more than just a couple of people uh, on the video, that they do very much believe in its authenticity. They say they verified the video. Of course, there's no way for us to independently confirm that. But just uh, in addition to what you were saying, there's also some uh, more facts that we're getting uh, from that article from the Build newspaper. They say that this video, which again was very shaky, was taken from the very back of the plane. Someone seemed to have been filming in the very back of the plane. They say it's unclear whether it was taken by a member of the crew uh, or whether it was taken by one of the passengers. Also unclear whether the person who was filming the video was standing or sitting. And then as you, as you said, it's those uh, very dramatic final moments. They say this video is only a few seconds long, but does show the final moments of what uh, happened uh, on that flight. A man in my shoes runs a light and all the papers lie tonight, but falling over you is the news of the day. That is a brutal, brutal story right there. There are some stories running today that uh, are wondering whether or not that video is, in fact, a hoax. I'm looking at one right now. I don't know what publication this is. It says, a video of German Wings A320 last minutes. Is it a hoax? Well, again, that is CNN from this morning that uh, claim it has been authenticated. And uh, this uh, this video, which was um, found on a SIM card from a cell phone at the crash site, Showing the um, showing the passengers freaking out. You can hear these screams. You can hear metallic banging. We did find out yesterday that the uh, one of the wings actually clipped the Alps, uh, which sent the plane into a uh, real um, uncontrollable path. The last couple of minutes, they had lost part of the wing before they even had the head-on crash that eventually destroyed the plane and sent all of those uh, passengers to their fiery death. So. Uh, just it's it's, it's uh, back and forth about um, whether this was terrorism or not, and well, well, of course it was because uh, terrorism not not on behalf of a god or Allah or ISIS or Al Qaeda, but uh, this guy who did uh, suffer from severe depression. Every news outlet today talking about how the airline knew it. There was a leave of absence in 2009. There were doctor notes strewn about his Dusseldorf apartment. Uh, including the day of the crash that said he shouldn't have been working that day. Uh, there was, it was widely known throughout the airline that this guy probably should not have been manning an aircraft, that his depression and his suicidal tendencies were that severe. And when, in fact, the pilot took an opportunity, and you can, I guess on, on one of the uh, boxes they actually hear the pilot say, I haven't peed since Spain, and the co-pilot's like, go ahead, I got it. And the pilot went to, take a, uh, went to the bathroom and was locked out and, and that's that. So, you know, we, we did like an hour of really good sports there. Brian Geltzeiler stopping by talking about Phil Jackson's message to Nick fans and Stephen A. Smith's response and the Heat losing to San Antonio last night and Kevin Durant's future and the red-hot Golden State Warriors in the midst of a 10-game winning streak and all that great NBA talk. And then a really special 20-minute conversation with one of the all-time greats, Tim McCarver, back to his days as a Cardinal, playing alongside guys like Bob Gibson and Roger Maris and Lou Brock and Stan the Man Musial and Steve Carlton and all those guys. And right up until the Cardinals and Cubs this year, 50-plus years later from McCarver's first opening day back in 1963. And then you get the reality check, which is basketball with Brian Geltzahler is great. Baseball with Tim McCarver is great. we got John Smoltz coming on in about 28 minutes. Baseball Hall of Famer. More baseball. That's great. Steve Lapp. Terrific college basketball coach at Manhattan, at um, Villanova, at Massachusetts. We'll do some Final Four. My guy Chris Mullen, now the new head coach at St. John's. All that is great, but while all that is going on, why we, um, why this show really differentiates itself from, from the rest and why it's better. 
People say, no, it's different. It's, it's, it's better. No, it's different. No, it's better. Is because while we do all that stuff, which is fun and great and hopefully for a couple of seconds takes your mind uh, off of all of it, we're not mindless in that we feel like we need to bring all of it to you. And this German wing story is, is horrible. It's depressing. There's really nothing good to come out of it. I, I love when people say, well, listen, God has, uh, we've been over this before, but God has this great plan. And, you know, those people died for a reason. And it, time after time after, I believe there were two infants on that plane. Yes. Somebody has to convince me what better plan, why those two little babies had to die crashing into the Alps in a fiery plane crash. Uh, I mean, listen, Phil Jackson's got a plan, too. The Knicks have 14 wins. I keep hearing Phil Jackson has a plan. Doesn't mean I like it. Well, I don't like all of God's plans. So Something better is going to happen from this. Somebody's got to let me know what that is, you know? Yeah, I, I don't know what good can be taken. Yeah, no, no, so, mean, no, no, he has a plan. We'll have much well, more stringent happen. testing now on yes, the pilots. We'll make now. sure now that uh, there's always going to be. Listen, <laughs> America's a mess. We don't do anything right here, including the president. But um, one of the things we do do right is... The law here is that there's got to be two guys in that cockpit at all times. We, we don't let one guy take control of the plane where something like this can happen like just happened. It doesn't happen here. So, yeah, there is. Uh, maybe we did learn something here. We did learn something. I hear a honking noise. Uh, That's my phone. It's ringing right now. <laughs> yeah. But, but why do we have to you know, have this happen? Well, I don't know that. Well, why would you ask me that? What, what, well, uh, I thought maybe you knew. I don't know. I know a lot of things, just not everything. So you didn't learn anything from this? I, I keep saying I, I don't, <laughs> I don't, and I never do. I, I, I don't buy into the old God's got a better plan and good things happen from bad things, and I believe all of that is nonsense, all of it. I'm sure those 148 people do too. I think it was 150, right, all together with the crew and the... Uh, hmm. I mean, I can't even imagine what those last couple of seconds were like. Flying in between mountains, knowing what's going on, because the pilot is yelling and screaming to get back into the cockpit, losing a piece of your wing. I couldn't even imagine. I mean, I, I didn't think I, about that. I, I, I hit a, an air pocket, and I just about passed exactly out. Exactly right. Oh, my wife is the worst, Daniel. My God. A well, little bit you, of tur- you don't need to feel the tur- yeah, turbulence oh, bouncing no, around for you. The air. I mean, again, 275 pounds oh. of twisted steel and sex appeal. And, and, Everything makes you pass well, out. You're the you're, biggest wimp I've ever met in my whole life. At 35,000 feet, I'm, well, I'm out helpless. Out Nothing's going to happen to you unless a pilot wants to do something. Or, but don't, turbulence is not going to kill you. Don't you also pass out when you get blood taken? But this yes, kid, of, this yes. kid is. So a, what? He's a me- That's why he goes to the gym. Because he's such a wuss that the only thing he's got going for him is built up all this How big muscle. dare you? Everything makes him pass out and squeamish. He can't even watch TV anymore without getting all bent out of shape. He's never seen a mob movie because he doesn't never, want to see right. any of the horror it, depra- in it, it makes him yeah. sad, yeah. Well, they're dark. Very dark. What's that? They're dark. People the, die. The con- yes. I, I was I, actually I, watching last night Mobsters, which is a... Um, which is a documentary program, an hour long. Is that ID also? I don't think it's ID. Okay. I think Red Rum was on ID, Ugh. and it was about uh, Lucchese, who did everything from fix the Sonny Liston Muhammad Ali fight, if not both of them, to run the garment district. And it, the way he made his big money, I, I was, I, I couldn't get off this show. I was so intrigued by it. it. Was after the Great Depression back in 1929. Lucchese made all of his money and millions. They said even during the time of the Great Depression, when nobody had money, he was netting $5 million a year because he basically, he took over the whole kosher chicken trade. You can't make it up. What? Back in the late 1920s and early 1930s in New York City, there was the kosher chicken trade was, um, was incredibly competitive. And you can't just call somebody from like a, uh, a service to come in and, and do the kosher. You have to be a rabbi. So there was no backup. So it was. So they they um. They this guy Lucchese ends up running the whole union for the kosher chicken guys, and he made a fortune. So he took uh, all the money he made from prohibition, because of course uh, in the early 1930s that stopped. So he had tons of money from prohibition. He started opening bars in New York City, then he ran the whole kosher chicken trade, Lucchese, and then. He took over the whole garment district because nobody had money in the garment district. Everybody had just enough money to make, like, the spring line. By the time the winter line came along, they were broke. 
And banks had no money back then, even after the Great Depression. So Lucchese ended up lending money to everybody uh, in, in the garment district, and he would double, triple, quadruple his money. Those guys could never pay him back quickly. So years and years and interest and interest and interest. And this guy made billions. Then he started you know, fixing fights. And, and guess what happened? What happened? In the, in the late 1960s, while he's splitting his time between New York and Miami, at the age of 66 years old, all of the millions and millions of dollars, which he still had, all of the tough guys he had around him, and all of the bodies he had scattered or from states from New York to Miami, guess what happened? He got a brain tumor, and none of that could save him. He was dead in two years. What's the moral of the story? What is the moral of the story? Health. It's all that matters. Health. doesn't matter how much money you've got, how much influence you've got, how big you are, how tough you are, how great you are. That's, this guy had everything. This, this guy, I didn't realize how, what kind of life this guy led. I mean, he was way before Castellano and Gotti's and the families of the 80s and 70s. This guy had it all. And the doctor told him he had a year to live. Now, he was a tough guy. He actually lasted two years, but I'm dead. Game over. Thanks for coming. Drive home safely. Now, is this a series? This was just a one-hour no, special. No, it's, 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 a, it's a series. It's, it's, uh, God, I feel like Mike and the Mad Dog here talking about uh, Daredevil. may want to find that, but it's, uh, it's on every night. It's, on, uh, okay, okay. Uh, it's not the Bravo channel. Maybe A&E. I don't know. Okay. But they go over, uh, like, all the, mob, they, they, the mobsters and drug dealers, and they do, like, our pieces on Al Capone, on John Gotti, on Luke Casey. But that question did uh, remind me of this. Would you, go see, would you go see Daredevil? Which one is that now? That's Ben Affleck's new movie about the guy who's a blind crime fighter who turns into Daredevil. True story? <laughs> no, it's a fiction. That's a, a whole fiction. Dude. <laughs> can't, can't make it. Mike and the Mad Dog classic. Here's uh, Gabe. Good morning, Gabriel. Uh, good morning, Sid. Uh, I, I just wanted to mention in passing that uh, every time you interview uh, uh, Tim McCarver, uh, my penis moves. Now I'm going to go write wow. that on Twitter. <laughs> Have a great day. Hey, thank you. That's... <laughs> Gabe is uh, is an old Missouri guy, you know, Kansas City, St. Louis. I think his grandfather. Gabe's kind of an odd uh, odd guy when it comes to his sports allegiances. He's a Jacksonville Jaguar football fan, a St. Louis Cardinal baseball fan. So he's kind of spread out, but he does love the Cardinal stuff. Anyway, we'll do more baseball coming up in about 19 minutes. Our next baseball guest is headed to the Hall of Fame this summer. After three, uh, really four, if you consider Joe Torre, played a lot of his career and managed in Atlanta. Started as an Atlanta Brave, won Rookie of the Year as an Atlanta Brave. Uh, Torre, along with Bobby Cox and Greg Maddox and Tom Glavin, where well, John Smoltz joins all those guys in the Hall of Fame this summer. He'll be here in about 19 minutes. College basketball with Steve Lapis. But next segment, back to you guys on the phones. 888-640-9385. 888-640-9385. More on a busy Wednesday right after this. New York Yankee baseball returns to 640 Sports. That ball is gone! What a shot! Catch all the excitement of opening day, Monday in their home opener. The Yankees play the Toronto Blue Jays at Yankee Stadium. A line drive right down the left field line and into the Blue Jays' bullpen. New York Yankees baseball. Ball game over. Yankees win. The Yankees win. Pinstripe fever. Catch it on 640 Sports. Hey, folks, it's Sid here to tell you about Madison's New York Grill and Bar, a slice of my favorite city, the Big Apple, right here in Boca. Madison's has delicious lunch specials from $10 to $14, available seven days a week. And the dinner menu has 14 brand-new items between appetizers, salads, and main course dishes. Plus, there's daily specials like Chilean sea bass, grouper, swordfish, trout, bronzino, 22-ounce bone-in cowboy steak, veal chop, lamb rack, and many more. Enjoy cozy dining on Madison's beautiful outdoor patio. Happy hour is seven days a week from 4 to 7 p.m. with great drink specials and new happy hour menu as well. Wine down on Tuesdays at Madison's. Hair price on select bottles and $5 on select wines by the glass. Call now for reservations. My good friend George is waiting for you to call. He's at 561-994-0808. Just one block west of I-95 on Glades Road. It's Madison's New York Grill and Bar, 561-994-0808. It's the best New York grill in Boca. Hi, this is Jim Lampley. Every sport has a champion. Every champion has a journey. 
Every journey has a story. Check out what's coming up on HBO. HBO's Boxing After Dark returns with a hard-hitting doubleheader in a junior welterweight showdown. Two of boxing's most exciting fighters square off when Lucas Matisse takes on Ruslan Provodnikov. But first, Terence Crawford takes on Thomas DeLorne in a junior welterweight title bout. Live Saturday, April 18th at 9.45 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. Then, on HBO's World Championship Boxing, undisputed heavyweight champion Vladimir Klitschko returns to the U.S. and puts his titles on the line against undefeated challenger Brian Jennings and undefeated Saddam Ali takes on Francisco Santana in a welterweight bout. Live from Madison Square Garden, Saturday, April 25th at 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. Plus, boxing star Canelo Alvarez returns to HBO in a battle of warriors when he takes on hard-hitting James Kirkland in a super welterweight fight. Live Saturday, May 9th at 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. Only on HBO. For all the stories, there's only one arena. HBO Sports. If you have Medicare Part D, Walgreens can put you at the corner of switching your prescriptions and saving some money. That's because Walgreens makes it easy to switch and save with co-pays as low as $0 on select Medicare Part D plans. Just bring us your prescriptions and we'll do the rest. Switch to save even more today. Walgreens, at the corner of happy and healthy. Applies to Tier 1 generics for select plans. Hey, it's Sid here with some very, very good news. Community Table now has food bundles. That's right. Get two whole cheese pizzas and a dozen wings for just $24.99 or one whole pizza, six wings, and two 20-ounce Pepsi products for just $15.99. These are perfect for your March Madness parties. And, of course, they'll deliver right to your door. There's a tremendous selection of paninis, gourmet hot dogs, specialty tacos, and now their variety of wings plus daily draft beer specials. They've even got gluten-free pizza and pasta. They're open seven days a week and still the home of a buck a slice and $8 pies. Check out their social media for more daily specials. Located right by the FAU campus and open till 2 a.m. on Friday and Saturdays. That's my guys at Community Table Pizza, Pasta, and Pints. 1901 Northwest 2nd Avenue in Boca Raton. Call for delivery at 561-672-7854 or visit today. That's 561-672-7854. Community Table, always fresh, always affordable. Meatball Room is a room filled with meatballs and other good things. There's pizza, pasta, fish, and shrimp, and people outside who sing. They have two great big bars, one's in the lounge and one's outside. You can eat at a big table with friends or alone with your chicken hide. Everyone's singing the praises of Meatball Room at Regency Court in Boca Raton. Delicious, authentic Tuscan Italian food, artisan cocktails, designer desserts, and so much more. And there's something going on every night of the week at Meatball Room. Meeples and sausage and chicken and fish and even a special or two. Ravioli, mussels and clams, calamari, congeli and whole wheat pasta for you. Visit Meatball Room at Regency Court in Boca Raton for dinner, drinks, or dessert seven days a week starting at 4 p.m. Meatball Rooms in Regency Court on Jog Road and Yamato too. Come by for a drink, their happy hours don't stink. It's five bucks for a plate full of food. Call 561-409-4111. See them on Facebook and come have some dinner and you're gonna have some fun. My name is Amanda Clark. I am a breakfast defector. I am reaching out to anyone trapped in their AM routine. We'll be at Taco Bell every morning starting at 7 a.m. Say no to breakfast blandwiches. There's something tastier out there, like the sausage AM crunch wrap, juicy sausage, eggs, and a crispy hash brown inside a grilled tortilla. If your mouth is watering, don't resist. Join us. Defect to the next generation of breakfast at Taco Bell. Wake up, live moss at participating locations. Now, now, more Sid Rosenberg Live. on 640 Sports.
Peter Gabriel, one of my all-time favorites. Of course, he um, made his bones with what band there? The Jews love him. That would have be Genesis. Very good. Who else is in that band? Let's see how good you are. Who else was in Genesis? Yes. Oh, uh, well, the most famous of all. Phil Collins. Very good. Um, the other guy uh, was a guitarist, and he had a very successful solo album of his own, you may remember, which uh, included um, the song about his father. You remember that? Um, Mike Rutherford and Mike the, Rutherford, Mike, Mike, Mike and the and mechanics. mechanics. Yeah, I didn't know. I was trying to think of his name. So he he was in he was in Genesis uh, too. Yeah, Genesis. Mike and the Mechanics and Peter Gabriel and Phil mm-hmm. Collins, all part of that group. And Peter Gabriel's uh, album. Now he had Salisbury Hill. He had uh, Shock the Monkey, but his album So, which included Red Rain and um, In Your Eyes, and the wonderful duet he did with Kate Bush, which uh, you can make an argument Don't Give Up is one of the great male female duets of all time. That album So was ama- not good, amazing. Lamb Lies on Broadway, one of the top albums also by Genesis, ever. No, but I'm, I'm not talking about Genesis. Yeah, but that was Genesis. We were just talking about No, that about was it. not. That was Peter Gabriel. Oh, that was Gabriel. Oh. Yeah. Didn't you just say what band? What? No, it's, it's, this is why you need to have your headphones on and be a part of it. When you walk in the getting... middle of a conversation, you maybe make a jackass out of yourself and then really us. So. Getting... That is a great album. You're right, but that's not... Uh... I was getting you water for your throat. Well, I understand. We don't have any cups well, here. Then, so I know you got excited because you happen to know the name of a Genesis album. No, I just... Just follow you, follow me on that album? Do you know? It's track nine on disc one. <laughs> <laughs> track, do you like Genesis? You have to. You're Jewish. Yeah, no, he I likes like, Genesis. Yeah. Of course he All does. All the Jews like Genesis. You yes. know that. Does that mean, does John Smoltz like Genesis? He's not Jewish. Well, it's, it's questionable then. What do you mean it's questionable? Well, if he's Jewish, it's a give me. But All if right. he's not, it, yeah. you know, he may go Maybe I'll way. ask him that. You know, reading John Smoltz's Wikipedia is a pain in the ass, and we're the only show that does this, of course. They'll come out with anybody else, and they'll be like, hey, congratulations on the Hall of Fame, and uh, how, how do the Braves look this year? Freddie Gonzalez. Well, but I'm more interested in the other stuff, as you guys well know, and, you know, this guy was going to run for Republican office in the state of Georgia a couple of years ago. That ended up giving money to a Democrat. Makes no sense. The guy is an unbelievable accordion player. Everybody knows from the state of Michigan he could have played pro baseball or basketball. He's an unbelievable golfer and his best friends and golfs all the time with Tiger Woods. And he's like a, a professional bowler, too. Well, I had no idea about a few of those things. He sounds like the most annoying guy ever. You know those guys like at the JCC on a Sunday morning who like, you play basketball with them and... They throw elbows, and they act like it's game seven of the Lakers and the Celtics. In the meantime, they're like insurance salesmen from the Oaks and little losers. And that's Smoltz. I mean, Smoltz, of course, is a Hall of Famer. I mean, but um, he's got to be like that now. Just so annoying. Like, just calm down, you know? He's a great athlete, and he knows it. Whatever. What do you mean, whatever? He's a good TV guy, too, now on MLB Network. Ah, he seems annoying. He just ran down the whole list of all his... Let's cancel him. What? I don't know. He seems annoying. I'm annoyed by him this morning. No. He's, he's, like, he's like good at everything. He's going into well, the- so he's humble, though. He doesn't... He's not humble. He's not humble. He's a dick, I guarantee you. No. I guarantee you he's out there yelling I mean, what and... What is One of those guys problem? on the basketball court. Yeah, bring it on. Yeah. Well... He's one of those guys. Well, see, he, he's, he, can, he don't have to talk. He can... No, he does both, though. I know it. I know it. No, I know he he's in Tiger's not. face on a Sunday morning. That's a pitcher mentality. I don't know about that. Can't you be humble and... He is. How you're do you know? You don't even know that. You don't even. You don't even know. You're bashing the guy already. I can tell the way he is. That that whole Glavin is humble. Glavin is more like a oh, shucks. Maddox. All all of them were humble. Smoltzy wasn't. Smoltzy, Smoltzy was a was a bulldog. What? I don't know. I think you're we should crazy. cancel him. You're crazy. You ask him. What am I going to ask what him? What are you going to ask How him? How stupid is this? So you're great at all Why these don't you different do- things. Well, I got a better idea, okay, Mr. Now you work for Palm Beach Broadcasting, day one, congratulations. If you have all the answers, why don't you do it? So how would you welcome me in? How would this go? Is John Smoltz on the How board? would I welcome him in? Yeah, I make believe I'm John Smoltz. Uh, say, hey, Smoltzy, what's up? No, see, you're not going to do that. What? Because he doesn't even know who the hell. You can't call him, you can't call him Marmaduke or Smoltzy. Marmaduke? Why that's would a, I call him Marmaduke? That's another one of his very famous nicknames. Really? How yeah. do you get that? Or do I even How know? do I know? You're I asking, know. I'm John Smoltz. Hey, John, how are you? Hey, Smoltzy, how'd you get that name? Marmaduke. Back to the Smoltzy stuff and well, Marmaduke. Well, I, I like to warm up to Well, it. you know, back uh, back in the good old days when, uh, blah, 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 blah. Hey, it's nice to be here. How are you guys? Great, great, great. Uh, 
listen, you're great at a lot of different sports. No, I see fine, you're fine, very fine, talented, fine. very talented. But uh, are you? How's, how's your attitude with all this? I mean, are you a bit of an ass or are you you humble about you it? You may or? be the worst interview I've ever heard in my was, whole life. What? You, What's the matter with you? You're that? making Orlando look like Charlie Rose. I swear to God. Hey, big Earl, welcome to Miami, man. No, I did fine. No, you didn't. It was awful. Try that again. What do you mean, try it again? Try it again. You're not being personable back. You're well, making it well, difficult. I hate to tell you, Smoltzy, Smoltzy is not exactly a uh, the lovey, cuddly type. Let's try that again. Welcome in is John. Hey, John Smoltz is with us today. How you doing this morning, I'm John? I'm great, uh, boys. It's nice to be back with you. How's everything? Good, good. Everything's great. Looking over your Wikipedia here. No, see, I'm not going to do My that. My God, what? I'm not going to say I'm looking over your Wikipedia, right. make it look like I'm reading up on the All guy, right. you idiot. All right. What's the matter with you? Well, I didn't know that Let's that try this. You. Let's try this again. <sighs> and you teach classes at Connecticut School. I mean, what? What do you ever have to teach a, a class on interviewing? Um, no, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> well, that's obvious. <laughs> Is that, do they expect you to, is that part of the curriculum? I don't know if that's part of the curriculum. You may want to call me for that one. Throw well, me the uh, 23 bucks you make for that night. Let's try this again. Go ahead. Hey, John, it's nice to talk to you. Great to have you on today. Hey, thanks, man. It's great to be back. You guys are great. Yeah, I'm just uh, noticing here. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, let's try it. Now, you be John, all right? Here's how it's going to go. All right. Hey, John. Uh, no, you're John. I'm John. Okay, uh, John Smoltz back on the show. Johnny, how are you, pal? Great. How are you doing, Sid? Good um, to be great. back. Thank you. you. One thing about you that I, uh, I fail to mention every time you come on, but I think I should, is mm-hmm. you're one of those guys that's great at everything. You're not just a Hall of Fame baseball pitcher. Oh, you, you, no. No, no. You could have played in the NBA. No. You're so... a tremendous bowler, well, a great golfer. Well, you know. You have mastered the accordion. I dabble. I don't know, but it's, it's I'm, seen, I'm very humble. But are you one of those guys like on a like on a Sunday morning and a choose up basketball game was a real dick? Well, no, of course not. I don't expect others to but, be. But, as but do you see how the whole, do you see the way the conversation? Well, went? no, yeah, you did it very naturally. Right. You're good at that. Right. Well, I can't. But you have natural conversations off the air. See, here's the thing. But but what you what you guys fail to understand in this business, and it happens at WQAM, and it happens at seven ninety the ticket, and it happens at nine forty, and every FM station and stations across the country is is when you're interviewing somebody, it should be no different than when you talk. Make believe the what, mic's not there. What, you're making me All nervous. All of a sudden, you break into this like, what are you nervous about? You're making me nervous. You're putting pressure on me. Try it again. No, see, this is this is very hard conditions. Very rough conditions. Try it again. Okay. We got John Smoltz with us today. Hey, John, how you doing? Hey, guys. Great to be back. Thanks. Good, good. You know, well, you know, I was... Um, no, that's just... enough for you. Just be quiet. Here's uh, Steve. Good morning, Steve. <laughs> uh, Sydney, this is brutal. I mean, I got to tell you, <laughs> if I was a student at Lingell's class up at the uh, Connecticut School of whatever, I would be immediately jumping on the website to see what the drop bad date is <laughs> so I could get a full refund for my class. I mean, you know, there's that saying, those who do do and those who can't teach. Right. Or maybe that's not the same, but it's close enough. The point is, is this is very, very, uh, this is very, very concerning to me. I mean, this is teaching our future broadcasters yes. of yes, Little yes. Havana. That's I mean, right. horrible. <laughs> Little Havana. You see what you do, and then, and then no, you, no, get, you, did this. you no, get these no, animals no, no, riled you, up. You did this. No, I didn't. You blame me. Blame us. See what you do. See? If you would have just uh, done done it the right way. And spoken English, it would have been I'm fine. not a practice player. I have to be live. I have to be in the game. Okay, so if I wasn't here today. If you weren't here. And, in fact, you were filling in. Right. And you had small time. Right. It would go. And I would rise right to the. Swimmingly well. Right. Exactly. I would rise to the occasion. What would you even ask him? What would I talk about? Yeah. I don't know. I'd have, to get his, <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to get his Wikipedia and find out. Oh, I'd whole, ask him about he's bowling. A, and, he's going into the Hall of Fame this summer. Would you want to start there? I would ask him what his favorite polka is to play with his accordion. His favorite polka? Correct. Well, the accordion is a very big instrument um, in a, Hungary, where your, your, your father yeah, got arrested. Well, so where yeah. you guys are from. That's well, a, they, seriously, that's they, a big deal. They kind of polka. And they play the polka. Well, they kind of polka there. Yeah. So I'm sure he's played a polka if he's got the, har- the accordion. Yeah. Uh, so that would be if, a, having a hairy chest. That would be a, that would be a, a really good question. Well, just, you know. it would see. I'd k- take him down a road he's not you, sure. where, ready for. Right. Oh, uh, see, see what see, you're doing when you, when you go down in the accordion. Yes, he probably hasn't done much accordion talk. Not not much of that. No, no. 
Well, maybe I'll, I'll allow you to. Uh, maybe we'll co-interview him. It'll be like um, Gail King and Charlie Rose. I don't. Know. And I could talk baseball, and you could talk uh, poker. And you may not. You may not want to do Hungarian that. accordion <laughs> players. <laughs> Who's the greatest to... Hungarian accordion player you ever met? It's Fagudvard. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't know that name? 